see what's going on here. Recording. I'm using a, I'm using a new screen, so it's a, a 4K screen, so I'm trying to get used to different sizes of things. Neat. So and, are we clearer? You can see our whiskers and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it can make a difference that way if I blow things up. It depends on what your resolution is, I guess. Uh -huh. So this time of the evening, it's, my resolution is fairly low. Yeah, and you can you can have Zoom. You know, make your make your appearance look better by going up uh, in the impossible. upper left hand corner. I think. Oh, let's see. Jane Peterson is coming, which is by Gary Peterson. Yeah, that's Gary. They're together. Hi, Gary. Well, that's a pretty good group. Still working on the audio. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Good. Are you? Yeah. Hey. hey, Gary. Hey, how are you? So, I know Good. Tim wants Tim wants to present the, his binocular mount stuff. <laughs> I've got a couple couple of uh, photos to show. Bob, Jerry, Hank, do you have anything that you want to talk about tonight? Uh, no, nothing. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. few updates since last week. I'll I'll. I, I can talk about this. I, I, I bought a new camera. Ooh. That's a. That's the one Jim was talking about. Yeah, well, Bob, but that's Bob has a new camera. Really nice. So Jerry, Jerry invented the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really nice mount. I mean, so I sell a, a sell mount. It's really, really, really nice. Is everything yeah. fitting? When you put it together, does it fit? What does it fit? Yeah. Does everything fit the, together? I don't have all the adjacent pieces yet. If you're talking to me, if you're talking to Tim, I think we're about to hear. Yeah. Oh, oh no, no, he he was talking about your the, oh. the 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 shell. We'll get to that later. You're you're the headliner with the. Uh, oh, the this is real headliner. simple. This shouldn't take long at all. Oh, uh, no, no, take your time. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Don uh, French is. Let, let, let me mention something. Hey, Tim, Tim, let me mention something first. You know, people, you can change from gallery view to speaker view. You can make things when a speaker shows something, you can make that bigger by going to speaker view up in the upper right hand corner. And so that's one way of going. And again, there's a, if you turn on chat, you can type in things there. If you want to uh, put in a website reference or, or some other comment you want to make, if you turn the chat on at the bottom of the screen, it's a great way to go. Hi, Jane. Hey there, I'm I'm the IT guy. Okay. <laughs> <There's Hi. that laughs> button. All right. So, we'll with that, I'll, I'll Tim. You Tim, you got the floor. Okay. okay. Um, you know, a, a while back, and then you can just you, you know, uh, Tom, feel free to go ahead and just put up any type of images that you want. But the, the, Gary Saronic did an article back in 2011 or something. It's a while back, and uh, he found that there was a, a, a binocular mount that he liked uh, in particular. It was really, really simple, easy. That's it right there. And uh, you can see that it's just, it's, it's a real simple mount put together with, with uh, just a, a regular, just regular tripod. And then he added a monopod that goes through the regular tripod. And then the part that I built, if you look at this, uh, this the, the image below there, you can see that there's a there's a um, right there. You can see the little U bolt that goes over the monopod arm, and underneath that, it's kind of hard to see. There it is, right there. That little block is kind of like uh, uh, what what I built. Don French, I built this this. Um, I think I was telling Hank about it. We were I built a, a mirror, a bino uh, uh, a bino viewer that utilized a mirror. But it wasn't a front surface mirror. It was reg just regular bathroom mirror and could for use for like 7 by 50, 10 by 50 binoculars. And in the meantime, Don got given uh, as a gift a larger uh, pair of binoculars and he just couldn't he couldn't mount it on that. So he sent me this article by Sir Gary Saronik and said, can you help me out? And uh, I kind of got in a back and forth with him and just said, look, you know, the I don't know what parts you have to build this. You kind of have to have an idea of what you have. And uh, 
since, since then, you know, he still hasn't responded. So what I did is I just said, okay, the monopad arm, yeah. it's going to just kind of be around three quarters of an inch. And I just built it for that. So um, uh, it's a real, real simple device. It's literally three quarter plywood. And you just cut yourself a, a piece of five inch by two and a half inch plywood and then cut that in half. So you have two squares, two and a half inches square. And on one side of that, if you have those, if you have some of those uh, images, Tom, that, that'd be kind of neat to put, pop them up here. Uh, yeah, gonna, and, I'll, I'll get there. Or you can see this is the completed, this is the completed uh, uh, piece right here. The little, uh, the little slots there where the monopod arm goes through, and on the bottom, you have, uh, you, you know, th that's this is where the uh, the arrow is where that that part is, and then of course uh, building the yeah build, building the part uh, it, it's it's real simple. You just simply take the two squares, two and a half inches square, and then drill a hole in one of them that's gonna be three quarters of an inch in the center, dead center, th three quarters of an inch. And then uh, to that, you add uh, in the four corners, you're gonna add some here. I don't know if you can, can you just show that, I can show you what it, better if I, if you just let me show it in here in, in front of you. Okay, hold hold on, Tim. I've I've lost my control of my screen, so okay, I'll have to see if I can get back there. Oops. Hello, Tim. Do you have a motor on the chair? <laughs> a motor? Yeah, to rotate the chair. Uh, yeah, I can do that. I... No, no. He means um, for your observing chair. Yeah. Oh no, I don't. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's the, the, the uh, we we discussed this, I think a week ago or two weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, somebody was talking about that they have chairs that actually do that. And and uh, the guy that this is going to, I'm sure, is not going to have that. He's going to literally have a real simple chair, even a chaise lounge. So he's going to have to set it up so he's looking at one target. And then go through the real hassle of moving everything to go to another target. But uh, I don't who somebody mentioned that there's a chair that you can get that you can uh, literally move. You can attach the tripod to your chair. Yeah, it's got a motor. Really? Down around a circle. That's really neat. That would be ideal. And then you can move it up. You can you, you have an out, so it's an out as chair. Yeah. And that would that would be absolutely ideal. Now yeah. for, him, for for this guy, he's um, the reason he asked me to build things, no matter how simple they are. And this is as simple as it gets. This little this little piece here, it's simple. I mean, like I said, this the piece in the center is just two and a half inches square, and these two end pieces, that's the other two and a half inches. So you start by cutting a three quarter inch hole. In the, in the center and then countersink a couple of uh, areas for screws to screw in the blocks. Then on the bottom, you're gonna do some countersinks that are gonna hold your little, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the little uh, nuts. Now, what I, what I did is I ended up using some of these, you know, a five eighths inch nut for a quarter, for a quarter 20 uh, standard connector. And they're like the, the little washers are, uh, where am I at? Okay, the little washers are about uh, five eighths of an inch. And then these are kind of cool because they call them jam nuts. They're, they're uh, quarter 20 nuts, but they're, ha they're kind of half the, kind of the half the, the width of a normal nut. So you can really countersink your holes uh, a little bit shallower than you normally would. And of course in here in the center, that, that's a hole that I cut that's seven sixteenths of an inch. And then you screw it. They have an attachment that you can take and, and for your screw inserts and you attach it to this gizmo. And I chuck it up in the, in the drill press and literally, you know, set this down on the drill press and then turn the, the spindle while I'm holding it down and it just threads right into the block. 
Hey, Tim, so Tim, it, Tim, do, Tim, does that uh, thing you just talked about, do you have to put glue on that so it, it when you turn it in? No, nothing. What it is is you cut the, 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 uh, the screw inserts. Uh, I don't have one in front of me. I wish I did. They're, they're threaded on the outside. They have threads on the outside. And then, of course, the quarter 20 threads on the inside. <laughs> and the whole thing has like a screwdriver uh, slot on them. So it's, a lot of people, they'll drill a hole and then they'll take a screwdriver and then screw them into the, into the hole that you made. But they have a really clever little device, McMaster car, that you can, you can purchase. And it literally holds the screw insert and you can chuck it up in your drill press and then literally turn it right down into the wood. The, re the reason that's good is because you can get this, you can get this inserted really level reasonably level the other way if you just try to screw it in using a, a crescent wrench or a screwdriver they end up getting all off off center and canted and everything but this other way works pretty damn good so i'm i'm imagining what happens here if you can imagine this and i don't i know we don't have the the uh, the, the the slides that I, I gave you tom but it, it would show that there's a u-bolt that goes down into here so that U-bolt comes over the top of the bar of the monopod bar and the, that monopod bar rests in this slot. Now that's attached to your tripod. And then the monopod goes out to, to the end where, and if you have that, if you have the picture of that lady in the chair, you can easily see how the thing's put together. It really is simple. And uh, for a couple of days, I was, I was wondering, well, how in the hell did, how in the hell did they get that? monopod to connect to the regular tripod well it's this little gizmo that's the one part that was missing you can buy one but this is much simpler to make and then what you do is you simply get a u-bolt that's going to be over the top of the bar the monopod bar and then at the end of the monopod you put another ball mount and that ball mount is going to be what attaches your binoculars to the other end he had a, just a simple jar that he put a bunch of spare change in as a counterweight. So I'm imagining that this little gizmo is attached to the tripod and that moves your, you know, that can move azimuth or altitude, I think. And then at the end of the monopod bar, if you have that image, you could put it up to him. That'd be very helpful. But if, at the end of that, there's another ball mount that attaches to your binoculars. I really don't understand that attachment, but it's, I think it's pretty simple. It's the one, it's right below the binoculars. It's, I guess it's just like a standard mount, uh, uh, a, a binocular uh, uh, adapter that goes into your, into your, uh, your binoculars. There's, the, there's how the thing fits real simple, but there, there's the little adapter. I don't really understand this. Uh, how how that little adapter works, but I'm, I'm sure you you screw it in. I think that's just a little ball mount at the end of the monopod arm that allows it to move and adjust, you know, up or down, right or left, as well as the tripod. And at the other end, you see this this uh, jar of just spare change for the counterweight. It's it's pretty clever, pretty pretty simple. I'm a real firm believer in simplicity. If you, if you can build something real simple, I think there's a certain beauty and strength in that. And this this is something that looks like it's 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 an easy kind of no brainer to make. This literally was just a five inch by two and a half piece uh, a two and a half inch piece of plywood that I just cut and put a bunch of screws in, and uh, and and one screw insert and. And then I'm going to get uh, from McMaster Car what's coming. The final piece is going to be these little U clamps, and then of course this little plastic tubing. I, you know, I know you can't see me, but there's a plastic tubing uh, that you put uh, that you put on the end uh, on the on the U clamp, and that's going to keep it from marring your monopod. So it's a real simple device, and I I think it I think it's really clever. And for Don, it's certainly going to be something that he can use. It's not going to cost him anything. I think he was giving the, he was given this these larger binoculars, and uh, I think he went out and bought a tripod, but I'm not sure. But I'm I'm what I did is I I never got a response from him saying what you know what he actually had and what the dimensions of it are. He's not real good at all that stuff. So 
I just said, look, the monopod arm, they're typically about three quarters of an inch. I think that's what that is. And if not, I can modify it. Somehow I'll modify it to make it work. So when do we see yours all together and operating? Oh, it's, it's, it won't be me. It'll be him. You know, I'm just gonna... Who just showed us the little part you made? Oh, yeah, I know. Or, it's just, you're not making little... the whole thing. You're just making that one part for Don? I'm going to make that one part because he's going to supply the rest. He's going to have his little tripod and then a monopod arm. If I, I don't really have a monopod arm, but, you know, I could imagine putting a pair of binoculars on a broomstick. I'm, I'm serious. You could or put this on a broomstick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you could just, you could hang a counterweight off of it and, and, uh, and, and put your binoculars on, on the end of that and really make it work. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. And so uh, um, what I, what I, and Jerry, the thing that I, I kind of like the idea of having this piece connected to a, uh, what's, what are the, what is the name? A ball, it's not just a ball mount, but it's a pan head, the pan head mount. So you can loosen the, the little, the little screw at the end of it, and then it swings right or left and up and down. So you really have a lot of latitude right there. And that's why I said you could just hang the binoculars off of a broomstick and you'd have all the movement you wanted. So uh, it's a real, like I said, it's a simple thing. Didn't cost me anything to make. Now I'm going to hand it off to Don and, and uh, tell him that's, that's the last one for a while. I got a lot of irons in the fire. Hey, and, Tim. Tim, where do you get that? What kind of plywood is that? And where do you get that stuff? And what kind of price? Well, the, that's, that's another, that's a whole nother uh, thing. You can go out to Home Depot and get uh, birch plywood and a full sheet's going to run you about 29 bucks. But yeah. they have pieces out there that you can get a quarter sheet, even an eighth of a sheet, you know, two foot by two foot. I've used a lot of that. I built the I built a gizmo called a Solara to make a guitar and it, I, I made it with the, it's right over here. If you want me to hold it up, uh, it, it's, it's two pieces, two sheets. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's pretty nasty stuff. And what you do is you end up dishing it out. And I don't know if this, if you're going to be able to see this, but you see that there's the Solara oh. and the thing you see there is uh, that's been sanded out. It's actually been scraped out and planed out. You actually make a uh, you make a guitar on this, and it's the Spanish method where you take these two sheets of plywood and glue them together, and you make all these slots and stuff. And and then you have to dish out the area that's over the bridge area to about two millimeters deep, so that that creates a dome on the top of your guitar. So what you saw there with this Baltic plywood is going through the, the top surface of the plywood. That's the only thing I don't like about the Baltic birch. It, you can see that you're cutting through the stratas of the different uh, plies in the plywood. And this these days, this is supposed to be pretty expensive wood and, and clean. It's not. What I found in there was that I don't know if you can see it, but you can see there's kind of a pattern that's like a it's kind of hard to get the lighting right. Yeah, we can see the hexagonal honeycomb pattern. Yeah, there's like a honeycomb pattern in there. <laughs> there were bits of string in there, and there was yeah, all find, kinds of when I work yeah. with that plywood, I find it's full of cavities. There's there's a lot, a lot of impurities and cavities in it, and the outer skins are all that's really, really good. That's right. Uh, MDF is a medium density fiberboard is another way to go, Tom, uh, Tom Totten. That's another way to go because it's, it's, it's really easy to machine uh, for this, for this particular application, this thing, it might work just fine. And it's a lot cheaper. You can, I'm using, I'm using a, a piece of that right now in this guitar project. It's called ultralight MDF. And it's like half the, the weight of this of this birch plywood, and easy to machine, but it, it didn't uh, it didn't it didn't work well for drilling holes. And it just the, the holes using a Forstner bit. I don't know if you know what those are, but the Forstner bits creates holes like the countersinks. There, they're flat bottomed, and you can you can literally cut a hole that goes all the way through. It's real clean. 
So you got to, but the, the Forstner bits using them with this, with this MDF, they kind of wobble and the holes just aren't, if you cut a half inch hole, it's not going to be a half inch. It's going to be just slightly over because uh, it just, just doesn't machine really well. At least my drill press isn't running really true. Joe had a pretty good one. You remember that one, Jerry? It's, he has a pretty nice drill press. But uh, the spindle on mine kind of, there's a little tiny run out on it. And that run out is enough to really make a difference. And, but in plywood like this, I mean, God, it, it comes out clean and right on the money. So, um, yeah, Tom, the, the, there's so many different types of, of wood out there that you can use for these projects. Baltic birch is a great product to, to uh, look for for building telescopes. Uh, the reason I love wood versus metal is because those cold nights can really get to you you just you touch that metal and you're it really sends a chill through you and wood for some reason also dampens better than than metal so if you're going to use it on any telescope you're going it, to it, it's going to settle out way quicker than any metal will so that's kind of what i like about that so as far as this little mount gizmo goes uh it's a real simple one and it's and i like the idea of it I may make myself one once someday because uh, it's 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 really a neat way to go. But I also found that what uh, that uh, Jurgen had, he had just a tripod that has that center post that you just crank it up and down. That works great. You can have all your visitors come up to the if we ever get back to having a star party, your visitors can come up to the scope and he can literally crank it to their height in a matter of seconds. And they just take a look, you adjust the width to their eyes, and you're up and going. It's 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 just great. So I don't know. What Gary said was really true. If you don't have that motorized chair, and I think Hank was talking about it a couple of weeks ago. If you don't have that motorized chair, it makes this kind of a torture. You know, you're looking at one thing, and then you have to, you know, you you kind of like to have like a lazy Susan backyard, you know, in order to make the thing work good. <laughs> So anyway, that's about it. it just, it's just that uh, uh, I think for this project, this was so simple. It impressed me with its simplicity. And that, like I said, I like that in a, in a, in a, uh, in a project. So that's about it. Okay, Tim, thank you for going through that. And I was going to show a couple pictures that I've taken the, over the past weekend of the sun and the moon and caught the, uh, the, uh, the partial penumbral eclipse, I guess it was. Let's see if I can show you that real quick. Share screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see. So the clouds this, must this have cleared is, for you. Yeah, well, it was, it was cloudy, but it was, it was okay to kind of shoot through. And there was a, you know, a moon dog or moon ring around it. But th this was the sun to start with. Whoa! So, 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 so that I, I, I wish I could take a shot like that, but of course that's from the Solar Dynamics uh, okay. Observatory, so took, I guess. So I don't it know off. if that's 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 the sun at night, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like calcium light. <laughs> let's see. I want to go. Uh, let's see if I can find my photo. What, what solar observatory was that? SDO. Is that the one by Big Bear or? No, it's a it's a satellite. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. So this is a photo I took, one of them, kind of showing that that same area going on. Uh huh. Nice prominences. So that, Good this play. Is, this, say that again, Chuck. What was Good, that? Good plage, the whitish areas. Ah, yeah. hadn't heard that term. Well, it's probably plage. It's French for beach. I thought it was plaque. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is like what the, Jerry and I both have Lunt 80 millimeter uh, H-alpha scope. So Jerry has a what some other uh, gizmos to go different. I don't know if you got a calcium filter or something as well. No, you get, you get the whole scope is either hydrogen alpha or calcium. You don't, you oh. don't get to interchange filters. Oh, really? So you have a separate the calcium filtered scope? 
No, I, I said that your picture looked like the calcium line of it, but my scope is exactly like yours. It's a hydrogen alpha only. Basically, all the action that happens on the sun is in hydrogen. The other lines, you can get scopes to look at them, but they're much, much fainter. That was taken with a satellite. Very clear view. Yeah, John Boyd has a calcium filtered, uh, I think it was not Lunt, but Coronado. Yeah. And it's horribly faint. Oh, really? Yeah. You're getting you for the sun. Why do you look at them? What, what? Why do you why look? Do you, why do you bother? Well, it has scientific value. I wouldn't say it has much aesthetic uh, value there. But uh, seeing the sun in different uh, chemical compositions tells you about the distribution of what's on the sun and, and what's playing in the plasma. Wow. So here you can see all my <laughs> shots I need to take to try to get somewhere. The, the, the moon was interesting because it uh, oh, yeah. had a, uh, oh, I don't want to do that. Get out of that, stop that. Yeah, there was a big 22 degree halo. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, can you see that halo? Yeah, yes. Okay. All right, and then uh, go back. I don't want this thing on. Hey. I'm, I'm seeing all the, just the, I'm seeing a screen of all your uh, image selections. Yeah. I don't see that. Individual. I, I, I popped a photo up there momentarily. You have to look, have to look real close, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where's my moon here? Hold on. Oh, let's see. So this is before, pretty much just at the very beginning of the eclipse. I don't know if you can, can you, can you see this? No. Oh, wait a minute. I may have a lag. There's a little bit of a lag, but I saw on Facebook during the eclipse that someone posted, there's something wrong with the moon. Go outside right now and see what's happening. Yeah. So this, this is pretty much before the, the, the eclipse. And then uh, let's see, how do I get back out of here? Stop that. Let's pick one of the pictures and double click on it. And, and this, is, this is where you can see the, can you see this? No, no. Let's see. Maybe I have to. Sh maybe I have to share it. Let me do this. Other share a separate screen here. Choose the right one. This looks like it here. All right, here we go. So it was a separate. So that's that's pretty much at one thirty at night, one thirty a.m. You can kind of see it getting kind of dull on the one side. Uh, what scope was this? Your eleven inch. No, this is just my just my camera, just my uh, oh. maybe uh, oh. three hundred millimeter uh, right. uh, lens on the, on, a, on my hand on my camera on a tripod. Mm -hmm. and cropped it down, but uh, yeah. I don't know what this line is up here on on there. Can you see my mouse highlighting mm -hmm. yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what area that is, Chuck. Do you know what that is? It's, that'd, be, that'd be kind of the north part of the moon. Yeah, the mountain, maybe there's a lot of libration there. Yeah. And we're seeing something we're not used to. There's the mountains right there. The, I don't know what they call those mountains. The Apennines. Oh, those. Yeah. yeah. Those are over yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the pointer was over there when I started off. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what causes that. I have to look up what that. What's there? There's a mountain range or something. I don't know. There's a sea. The dark area is a sea over there. Up here. Yeah, the two light areas are are highlands. The dark okay. area is a sea. Oh, that's right. The sea, the the sea goes all the way from where you're showing it with the with the uh, with your cursor, and it goes all the way over the top to the other side. That's all the, kind of the same the same ocean. Huh. I'll have to look up, look that up. Yeah. Anyway, that was my event. So what it, it was it was it was penumbral. So it wasn't a full eclipse. It, it was it noticeable. It wasn't a dark one. I think. Well, I think they said it was like forty four percent penumbral uh, eclipse. Now, 
Does that does that mean, Chuck, that any part of the umbra comes over the moon, or is it all penumbral? Oh, there was no umbra. It was deep penumbral, so it went close to the umbra. I just called up a moon, uh, you know, feature map, and it doesn't show any mares up there. In that area. <coughs> really? So I don't know where that dark's coming from. I yeah. thought that it went over. The, I thought there were, it arced over the top. There's like a I can't remember the 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 ocean over on the other side, and I I used to always look at that and say that it, there were, it's like a finger came over to over the top of it, and so where the the Apennine Mountains were and just north of that. Well, we, the uh, Apennines are are in the central part of the moon, off to the left of the Sea of Serenity, the head of the soccer player there. Yeah, yeah. And there's Mari Frigoris that's up in the north, but it's not as at all a long line like you see there. That's between Crisium and the and the and the top. So I don't know what you're seeing there. Oh, that's that, that's, that's it right that's, there. That's, that's what uh -oh. that's what it is. That's it you right see, there. You no, see that? It, yeah, it's Mar Frigoris. Frig, Frigor. Fr yeah, yeah, yeah. Frigoris. Frigoris. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I was looking at a. Uh, northwest, east, south orthogonal moon, and that, and not the tilted version. Okay, I I, I, li I like this moon map. It's it's called it's on a website called Scientific Psychic, which is pretty strange, uh -huh. but it, it's got this great uh, moon uh, map for the major major features. Oh, that's yeah, and, it is neat, and it it shows you what they are, or highlights some of the craters. I kind of, kind of like kind of like that Plato. Can you bring that up at a star party? I mean, is it an app or is it is it something it's a, you it's a, have to? Have? It's a website. It's a website. Boy, it's too bad you didn't have an app that worked that way. God, that there be great. There, I have an app that I that's called Moon Atlas, and I use that on my iPad. Okay. Yeah, because that would be neat, you know, because you're showing people, you know, Michael Jordan and the basketball and all that, and it's. You could just, you just literally, literally literally highlight the ball, and it'll tell you what it is. So, yeah. isn't it Chrysium? Yeah, Chrysium. Yeah. So anyway, that's I like that website. I'll have to copy that. And this little guy over here, what's that? Oh, you can't see my pointer. <laughs> <laughs> Sharing works only one way. What, what side okay, of the moon is it? What are uh, you looking at, Jerry? Seven thirty position. Seven thirty, that one? No, the dark spot up above that to the air. Uh, Grimaldi. Grimaldi. Oh, it's a crater. Grimaldi, huh? Okay. Tom, what's the name of this one again? I'll put it in the chat, and and, and so if you open up a chat box, put open up your chat box. You'll I'll type a message. I'll type the website in there you can see that uh, you go to scientificpsychic.com and look for the solar system and then oh. look for moon map okay yeah i like that okay hey tom did you get my little chat that i sent did you did you write a chat thing yeah no i didn't see it there was a guy named Glenn Bachelor that has some beginning newbie questions. He was thinking of getting a scope and I told him to try, you know, that he could try to sign in with us. And I just wondered if he tried to sign in or not. Oh, uh, I did you give him uh, the link and yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see your, I see your message. No, I didn't, I didn't, don't see him. Okay. No, no one's waiting to be admitted. Okay. Do, do you know Glenn Bachelor? Do you know where he's from? Uh, Santa Barbara somewhere, I think. He contacted Colin. Colin sent forwarded to me, and I said, "Okay, you know, go to Sky and Telescope. Go to uh, Orion to look at their offerings. Look at OPT." And then I said, "You know, if you want, you can come and ask on on the Zoom." All right, Bob. Bob, did you have something you wanted to show us? Yeah, um, actually, I'll put this. Uh, I'll put this in the chat because uh, it's a web page. We're just looking at this now. Let's see how I do this. Um, uh -oh, are you sharing now? Uh, no, oh, no, I, think I did. I did. 
I did that accidentally. Okay, sorry, here I got it. So I just put something in the chat, a link here. I'll, uh, I'll actually open it up too. This, this was pretty interesting. Uh, I found this online today about the uh, AVX mount. Let's see if I can find this here. Uh, ah, it's not showing up in my thing here. Let me open, let me open something different and then see if I can open it here. Oh, I know, because I switch. Okay, so anyway, here's, here's the link. For those of you that have the Celestron AVX mount, um, I would not attempt to do what this guy did. Uh, some of you might, maybe Hank would or something. Um, totally took this thing apart, but he answered a couple of questions that were interesting. I'm seeing a, a graph, four graphs of, of gain and read noise. Okay, uh, it says you are screen sharing. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing are. a rock inside the guy's bearing. Yeah, there. That, so he said here, you know, this thing. Okay, so as uh, you can see the web page here. So there, there's this, there's a pebble inside the thing when I'm he opened sure, it I'm up. Sure. I'm seeing a graph too. Yeah, I'm seeing the graph as well for the ZWO camera graph. Oh, okay. That's that's what I was sharing before. Okay, let me let me stop share. Let me let me try it again. Um, yeah, I was going to the web page, so I was looking at my own screen. Okay, here it is now. Okay, I it was stuck in that one share. So this this guy had done a uh, kind of a nice thing here on um, how he took apart a Celestion AVX uh, mount, and uh, you know, which again I was saying I wouldn't do, but um, kind of funny from the factory. There's a little there's a little pebble inside the thing, you know, when they assembled wow. it. Was wow. just, just bizarre, you know, because there are all the gears in there. And then he answered a question. It must have been a windy day when he put it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, well, I guess they're all made in China, right? So um, he said, you know, you know how it's like one guy on a um, YouTube video refers to it for the balancing as gummy, that the, you know, the balance is gummy. And he said, oh, I found out why. It's just stuffed full of grease. They just, they just chalk this thing full of grease. So he said, he basically cleaned all the grease out and uh, he bought a new one of the bearings, which he, one of these guys, I guess, which he said was pretty cheap, but a little, little, you know, not, not easy to find, but you know, I, I wouldn't want to do this with mine unless it was just totally a lost cause and it broke. But um, it was just interesting to, you know, to, to hear what he has to say about the basics of the mount here. So that that link is in the chat if you guys want to copy it and save it and you know look at it later. So what and, was the key to his making it a better mount? Was it degreasing it? And um, it I think is that all? Well, let's see. He did. Um, let's see. Well, for the the balancing, you know, getting the grease out was a big thing for balancing it. Yeah. And he's got about most of this is instructions on how to take it apart. Obviously, you got, you got the rock out of there. Um, I usually have no trouble getting things apart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I don't know. He, you know, mainly I, he says in here why he did it and everything. But I just read this kind of quickly. But I just thought uh, I'd, I'd show this to you guys and have you take a look and see what you think. But uh, good grief. There, <laughs> I'd be done right there. I know. I know what I would do is I'd, I'd have about three video cameras going while I was doing it, just so, you know, I could not, not, you know, forget what I did or anything like that. But um, two other things that I did was um, the last uh, couple of nights, uh, that sharp cap software that I told you about, I, I set up my scope and I was able to uh, use the polar line feature for the first time. And I got it within about six or seven arc seconds. Uh, using their utility. The odd thing was when I did that, then I used the two star alignment for the AVX mount. Um, and I was trying to get extra stars, but it's just, it's so frustrating because all the stars, I, I can look towards the west, you know, I can look straight up and I can look towards the west and the south a little bit, but I can't really look east. And every star it's trying to show me besides um, Vega and Altair are all like, towards the east and I 
I have a tree in the way. So, you know, I keep having to go to the next star, next star. So that's really frustrating. So I'm looking forward to um, switching to um, PhD2 that we talked about before. And the guy, um, Dylan O'Donnell uh, online, he says, you know, throw away your, your VT, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ST4 cable. What, what he's saying, he's saying, don't, you know, he said, even the PhD two guys, when you go through the wizard and start to use it, that they say, here's method number one, we do not recommend this. And that's to connect your guide scope camera to the mount itself through the, the, my Santa right is a VT4, VT4, SD4, whatever it is. SD4. SD4. So, and, you know, because now your computer is not talking directly to the mount, your computer is only talking to the camera. So the other way with a Celestron AVX, it's probably something similar in others is the end of the little handheld go to, there's a little plug and then you plug that through to your computer and now your computer can, you know, talk to the, the mount directly. With PhD2, when you do this, you don't even have to do the two-star alignment or anything. You can use uh, plate solving and, um, you know, do, do alignment by plate solving. So last night I was, it was so weird, I think because I didn't have a good alignment. I finally gave up on the stars. And then I said, do a solar system align. And I, I go, go to Jupiter. It's way off of Jupiter. Even though I have a perfectly polar aligned, it was way off. I got it on Jupiter and I said, okay, there's Jupiter, enter a line. And then it says done. I'm like, wait a minute. You can't align yeah. with one planet, you know? So I, I was if just trying got, to- If it's got the time right and your latitude right, yes, you can. Well, I have done it in the past, but for some reason it's it's kind of misbehaving now. I don't, I don't know why it was doing that. And, you know, I've got polar alignment, you know, as, about as good as I can get it. And, uh, but I, I'm not- um, for some reason, I, and I know why, if I had the whole sky with the stars, I think, you know, I, I could do better. I was going to maybe set it up in the front um, and do that. But uh, here, I'll <laughs> stop to share because we don't need that. <coughs> so, well, what's, um, plate, what's plate solving? So plate solving, you can point to, you know, anywhere. If I want to go to, I don't know, I was trying to go to the Andromeda Galaxy. I wanted to try, because I got this new camera. I got the ASI 224. Uh, it's a kind of a somewhat discount color camera. And I wanted to try to, you know, just take some. And I actually got up and tried to do Orion. And by then the Celestron turns its tracking off for some reason. And I didn't want to go mm. through another alignment again. It had stopped, stopped tracking. Actually, when I said go to Orion, it, it did a, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, meridian, meridian flip. Yeah, the meridian flip. And then after it did the meridian flip, it, it wasn't, it, it wouldn't follow it anymore. And I, I finally managed to get it, you know, visible. And uh, once I got it visible, I could see it's just tracking across, you know, there was no, there was no tracking going on at all. And it was like, I don't know, 2.30 in the morning, 3 in the morning. And I go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. But um, so with the plate solving, I, I, again, I haven't tried it with PhD too, but um, you can point at an area of the sky and it's just going to do, you know, it's the lost in space problem. It's going to look at the stars oh, oh. and figure out exactly where it's pointing. And then, what a guy said, and I was just like music to my ears. You don't have to do any any alignment anymore with the mount if if you use the, and it, you, you, maybe you guys know better, but it, you know it's the guy said um, this is a guy that's in uh, Holland, I think. That I was watching a video actually right before seven thirty before this came on, and um, there's also I watched a, an hour long video today by uh, Dr. Robin Glover, and he's the guy who wrote the uh, Sharp Cap software. And uh, it's about an hour long video. It's really interesting in terms of cameras and read noise and um, you know, just how, how long of an exposure, what's the optimum exposure and how to figure that out. And actually in that sharp cap software, and you can do this with the, um, the manufacturer's curves, but you can, you can do calculations. He has a, a sensor analysis thing that you do that, that can take a while to do, but it'll, it'll do the read noise and, and everything for whatever type of camera you have hooked up to your, to your system. And I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of a cool feature, you know? And then that, with that, you can store that and then kind of optimize when you're looking at a given target, a given situation, you know, what, what uh, exposure. And he said, it's a big misnomer that people say in the, in the forums to say, 
uh, increase the length of your subs, just doing longer and longer subs. And it's, it's um, for the subframes. And he said, that's not really true because you get this flattened curve with read noise as you go out to the right. It, it's not buying you anything to do longer exposures and obviously going to be harder to track. So, uh, so anyway, I'm just trying to educate myself and come up to speed with all that. Um, and uh, I, the funny thing is, well, one last thing with the Celestron with the mount, even though I, I'm having trouble pointing it now, and again, I think I should be able to fix that once I can get the, do the alignment thing better. Um, once it's on something, as since I have that polar alignment, it stays on it pretty well. So it's, it's like the best it's done for that so far in terms There's of- no track. substitute for good polar alignment. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was working pretty well. So, um, so anyway, that's, yeah, that's my- Like everything, it, it, it's a, it's a trade-off. If you take too long a subframe, you have problems with read noise. But if you have too many frames to staff, you build up a stacking noise. Right. So you want to keep the number of frames down below um, certainly a hundred or so. And, but in uh, but to get longer frames, um, I always prefer that. I do about six minute subframes and I don't go much longer than that. Yeah, well, he has a formula for that. Um, yeah, yeah where, for that. where you can do the, you know, the read noise squared over the, you know, yeah. whatever and, and come up with all that. So I'm gonna, I'm going to be looking at the read noise of the of the unit that I bought, and um, play around with that, and probably do that sensor analysis thing too. But um, yeah, I've been just kind of frustrated. I the video that you saw from that guy. What's his background? Is he an engineer or a scientist or amateur only? The Dr. Robin Glover, you mean, or or uh, yeah, that guy. He's the guy who wrote Sharp Cap. So um, he's he's. He's, uh, he's a pretty intelligent guy. He's, uh, I guess he's British. I don't know. He has a British accent, but um, he's, um, <clears throat> I mean, some of the guys, like the guy who wrote PhD2, I guess, wrote it and then kind of walked away and, and you know, he doesn't want any money for it. Um, yeah, Dr. Robin Glover is, is getting, he's getting some money for it now for the pro version anyway. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I wasn't impugning him as, as, as how smart he was, but there's a language difference, especially with regard to our field because we have um, a lot of non-technical people that do this for uh, fun like me and uh, the yet it's a it's a interface between scientific and engineering technology and colloquial language and i pointed this out to sky and telescope once before that they're writing confusing articles because they're using the word noise for things that aren't noise it's signal that's that they don't want which is not really noise but colloquially, everybody thinks of that as noise. And when people, you try and explain imaging to people, if they don't understand the difference between colloquial noise and physical noise, then they get very confused about what you're talking about. Oh, no, he, it, I'd say, in fact, I can look this video up. I'll put the link in the chat room. I, I'd recommend watching it. Yeah, I'd like to see he, it. He starts, it's a, it's a video of a talk. He starts from the point of view of the human eye. And he says the retina of the human eye can actually physically detect one photon of light, but yeah. it just doesn't register with the brain. And then he goes forward on how you need about a thousand photons hitting the retina before we, you know, and then he goes forward how a camera works, how CCD works, how CMOS works. And so he goes through the, he goes through the whole thing. He goes through in, in pretty good detail and he, he definitely defines his terms. So, I mean, with the, with the read noise and he, he describes the randomness too, uh, which is, it, it's just pretty interesting. He goes through start to finish on that. So I'd Bob, say it's pretty, yeah. yeah I'd like to see it. Bob, I think I put the link uh, of the vi YouTube video in, in the chat there. It, sa it says deep sky astrophotography with CMOS cameras by Dr. Robin Glover. Is, is that the video you were talking about? Yeah, and then I think those other things at the end there might, it looks like there's spaces. I think there are underscores in between because that's part of the, I don't know. Let me just click on it and see if it'll if it opens up a window here for me. Uh, this invention is 50 times stronger than regular glue. Keep watching. How's it going, everybody? For the air pressure photography. Something or that me or someone else? Not me. Not me. Okay, maybe that was mine. What's that? 
I was trying to click on that link and see if I could. Uh, I did. Remember? Got me a, a Russian-speaking gentleman, not named Lama Gober, unless this guy was going to introduce him. Okay, here I'm going to put. The... I want to show you how the golfers like us can unlock 20, 30 yards of extra distance and just. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you know what kind of videos I watch too much of the golf. Um, so let's see. I will go back to this. Am I on share here? Did I do share? No. No. Not, not yet. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to chat. Go back to chat. And here is the here is the link for the Dr. Robin Glover. Um, he's he's a just I looked him up. He's a clinical child psychologist. Oh, really? Yeah, and software <laughs> architect. So he's probably more from the engineering side than the science side, Jerry. I think that's somebody else. That's not me, is it? it? The microphone was showing that you're the active speaker there when that's on. Really? No, that one doesn't take me to anything either. It's the same guy, Rashid something or other. Yeah. Well, this Robin Glover, Jerry, I don't know if you heard, but he's a child psychologist. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. And that's he's a, a software theme, developer, so he's coming theme, more from the engineering the side. Okay. That doesn't no. mean the engineering wrong. Can you guys try that link, see if it shows up correctly as uh, Dr. Robin Glover? I did. Oh, and it does? Not. Well, what you know, it? Bob, Bob, you and I put down the same link in the chat. It's the same link. That's the same link. Yeah, it's the same link. Let's see. Where, where so, meaning, okay, meaning what? It's it's not the right link, or from, to you pull a phrase to... from from the magic pudding, it's a low put up job on our credulity. <laughs> no, I'm just it, it, you might have to copy the link carefully to make sure you don't get any extra characters there to, and put it in the in the address bar. Yeah, no, I I just did it again. That's. I'm going to try clicking on it, do a control. Yeah, no, it works for me when I when I do control left click on it, it works for me. Is that a dark haired guy with tattoos down his left arm? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How odd. Okay. okay well, works. if you just if you just go to YouTube and you type yeah, that's what Dr. DR space Robin space G L O V E R, yeah. the first link is you'll you'll get is is him okay. in that in that thing. So I, I don't know the link I put down there works for me. So oh maybe you guys are trying that one from 820 p.m. Try the one from 824. Anyway. All right, so I mean that that's too long to go into, but I'd I'd uh, look that up when you get a chance. It's pretty pretty interesting because um, in terms of you know when you look at the um, basically the the hieroglyphics you know charts on the stats of the cameras you know quantum efficiency and this that and read noise uh, over uh, exposure time. Um, it's nice to have it explained you know the way this guy did. I, he did a pretty good job of it, I think. So so uh, anyway. That's my input. Okay, I, I put a link in the chat from Hank. Uh, had a had a um, video on YouTube about solar flares and such. Yeah, this was a, a, a video by Mark Townley that I ran into the other day from from uh, the Sky Searches. And when uh, Chuck was mentioning the term plage, that reminded me of it because I had never heard of it before. But Mark Townley talks about that. This is a video. It's pretty interesting. It's about uh, the effects of uh, solar weather on, on Earth and, and on airplane routes and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they're, they're also talking a lot about the uh, period of 11 years. There's, so we're now going in and you know, we're now in the upswing of the solar <laughs> flares, I guess. We started. Yeah, they, 
they said a couple was it on the 29th i think there was a flare on the sun not facing the earth but i guess it was pretty powerful and it caused a shortwave block uh blackout in the like the south atlantic i guess area it seemed like on the map i saw yeah so, yeah yeah, they, they mentioned a number of examples, a number of historic examples. Yeah, when Reagan was in Air Force One, they, they lost all communication, I think. Yeah. And that was a small spot, too. It rotated around today, if you go to spaceweather.com, and they said, wow, you know, kind of a rinky-dink spot, but it gave out a big uh, big blast, an X-class yeah. flare. Did they ever prove the Maunder minimum, or is that was it just theory only, Chuck? Well, that's records from the 1400s or something or on. Yeah. Um, and, and there was a there seemed to have been a minimum in sunspot activity. I... But they never really actually said, oh, OK, there's a there is a direct uh, relation to the, you know, missing so, uh, sunspots and then earth weather or climate. So well, there, there was a mini, oh. you know, not a, I guess a mini ice age. There was a cold period. There was a cold period in Europe then. Oh, I yeah. don't know that they've definitively linked it. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it does have an effect. So there, there's a, a certain sphere, I don't know exactly, a part of the atmosphere, which can be 600 kilometers up and down, depending upon whether you're in the solar minimum or, or, or not. Yeah. And also uh, the, the presence of those uh, solar, solar spots, uh, they sort of uh, um, chase away the, uh, the um, cosmic rays, actually. So... That means that airplanes can change their routes. So if there's a solar uh, minimum, they will go farther, uh, let's see, further north or anyway, I forgot which way it was, but- During it's kind solar of minimum, you get more cosmic rays. So they would try to stay rays. lower exactly. altitude and- Yeah, so then they have to go lower. They can't go over the poles and you have more solar flares and they can go higher. And I well, know, I, 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 I've never heard any of this. This is, this is interesting. Yeah. Anyway, it's uh, you may want to check it out. It's it's an interesting video, I think. Mm. Okay. Have you guys been to the spaceweather.com uh, website? Yeah. Yeah. It, that is that is such a great thing to watch d almost daily, I guess. See what's going on. I, they can send you notifications too. That's what they do for me. They just send them. Craig Prater signed up for that 10 years ago or 12 years ago. He signed yeah. up for that and got a phone call at 2 a.m. saying, your local Z index is higher than this. Get outside and get Aurora <laughs> photos. And he went out to the bridge to nowhere. And he said he couldn't see anything visually except a whitish kind of effect. But when he put his camera down and just did a 10 second exposure, he got this huge pink Aurora over the mountains. Whoa. Whoa. Uh -huh. That's amazing for Santa yeah. Barbara. Yeah. You know, Chuck, do you remember that star party that we got visitors from another astronomy club up north and that they were saying there's, they looked over, they looked north of us towards Polaris and they just took a look over Camino Cielo and said, you're getting auroras right there. Uh -huh. do, do, you have, do you have a recollection of that? No. Uh -huh. Yeah. They, but they, we did I, have folks from Mount Diablo, I think. They're, I can't remember where they were where they were from, but they they just took one look over Camino Cielo and said, "Hey, that's that's an aurora." Uh, and I and somebody went home. I thought it was you, and you checked it out, and sure enough, it was. There was a lot of aurora activity then. Yeah, it could be. I know yeah. I was up at Kachuma, and I was looking at a big sunspot during the day, and uh, that evening I saw red to the north, and I thought, "Oh no, brush fire, of course." Yeah, and and then an, I saw an ambulance come out, and I thought, okay, I was seeing his red light because somebody had a heart attack in the in the campground. But oh, then great. after the ambulance left, it was still there, and it was an aurora, and it was bright pink, and then green blobs moving back and forth across the horizon, and then violet streamers that were shooting up into the zenith and then disappearing, and it oh, lasted oh. forty five minutes, and then it went away. Quite spectacular. It was neat. Yeah, yeah, there was a guy that said, I made a trip all the way to Alaska to watch these things, and it's a better one here than I got in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know during solar minimums, the uh, atmosphere of the Earth swells, and it f sticks farther out into space, and very low-flying, very low-orbiting satellites then have their lifetime reduced. 
because they start experiencing more drag than they would otherwise. You, you see that uh, the uh, dosage of, uh, what is this? It's cosmic rays that they're talking about here, yeah. hot flights. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, 45,000 feet. Yeah, you're probably going to get a few there. Yeah. Magnetic pole reversal will, will get them all <laughs> over, I guess. Yeah, airline pilots are uh, at risk of radiation related uh, illnesses and conditions. And stewardesses. Stu yes, yeah, stewardesses too, and the Million Mile Club. Yeah. <laughs> the Million Mile or the Mile High Club? Oh, yeah. The mile club. Not the Mile High Club. <laughs> That's a one shot deal. The Million Mile High Club. Yeah. It looks like uh, the Earth got just got missed by uh, an, an asteroid six meters in diameter. Well, that's and, that piece that they think is the Centaur booster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I watched a thing, uh, you know, so the thing that Elon Musk launched, the uh, Tesla with uh, the yeah. astronaut that they call Starman. So that that's in a like a solar orbit, but they said... Uh, right. They actually recalculated. NASA was calculating at first. They thought it was like 2091. It was going to come kind of close to Earth, but now I think it's like 2050 something. But it's actually going to come close to Mars a couple of times before. Yeah, it's out, it's out close to Mars now. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I thought that better not interfere with like perseverance or any yeah. of those things. Yeah. <laughs> first traffic accident in space. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh you know, speaking of that, these, what, what are the, the satellites they're putting up there? What's that whole system they're putting Starlink. up there? Starlink. Yeah, Starlink. Yeah, Starlink. Is, is that, are, are they protecting us for, I mean, is it going to be uh, only kind of at dusk that they show up or is it, is there? No, they're going to show up. They're going to show up for the big telescopes all the time. So they're they, actually, it, they say they're trying to work with them on that. They're they're trying to you know set up them in, in avoiding, yeah. uh, and all, they're, they're also going up to higher altitude orbits eventually. Yeah, and they're going to paint them all black, I guess now. <laughs> well, they sent up a series that was painted black, and it wasn't enough. Yeah. Oh. I'm not surprised. Yeah. And so how many you got these super sensitive like the LSST? That's going to be finding them all the time. How, how, how many are up there? There's a ton up there, isn't there? It, oh. Right now, they're going towards 12,000. The eventual plan is 60,000, I think, that they're going to put up, I heard. And this yeah, is telecommunications? You know, That's what it is? Yeah, it's the internet. It's worldwide internet. It's, yeah, oh. the phone, it's your uh, cell phone. Yeah, Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah. So That's boy, what, all we need is for one of those to collide, and we're going to have you know, a, a fission reaction. <laughs> Oh, nice. A chain reaction? Yeah. So, um, Tom, did you get the picture I sent around today of Arecibo from the air? Yeah, hold on. In the email? I got that. Ar Arecibo? Yeah. Bye-bye, right Arecibo. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. Really? Yeah, I thought they were filming another James Bond movie, but I guess <laughs> it's just uh, some cable snap. And it pretty much trashed the whole installation. Yeah, that oh, whole central gondola fell down. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah the next Bond movie with that would be called Radio Astronomy Another Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it'll be filmed in China. <laughs> China's having trouble with theirs, too. With uh, trouble. With, with trouble. Water accumulating or? No, no, cable, uh, ca getting the cable tensions right. Ah. See, Arecibo is, was a sphere and it has spherical aberration. And so the probe that they listen for or the, is an antenna that sticks straight down. So it picks up all along the focal plane, which is called a caustic of a, of a sphere. But China is trying to make theirs a parabola for more imaging. And they're having trouble getting the tensions right, so the whole dish becomes a good parabola. Oh, that sounds that sounds really nasty. So, Jerry, how do they figure focal length on radio telescopes? Um, 
you just take the laser and put it beside your head and you know <laughs> I think they they um, they they have the drawings the mechanical drawings you can figure out the radius of curvature and for a, a pl in, incident plane wave you can easily get the focal plane of it and you can figure out any aberrations if you know the sphere, you know what the shape is and for a sphere it's extremely simple you get the caustic curve and so your antenna has to follow that curve to pick up all the radiation. So why would they go for par parabolic uh, antennas as opposed to spherical, which is basically good for a long focal length, right? It's higher resolution. And there's only, you don't have a long antenna you have to pick up from. You just have a, a, a horn up in one place. All the radiation comes in there to a, a diffraction limited spot, which is a pretty big you know, the wavelength's real long, so it's a big spot. So, oh, I, I guess they were going you. for the gold. I wanted to show you this in my, I talked about my uh, Celestron uh, CGX mount, and I was having grinding problems. And there's little, there's a motor for the deck in the RA. Wait, there's and stuff it has in the worm, worm gear. Yeah, worm gear. And you have these screws one screw has, I guess, a spring behind it, and the other screw is just is a limiting screw. And huh. evidently, I got it a little bit. There, there was no bounce allowed, so I loosened this up just a, you know, half a fraction of a turn, and uh, it it got got rid of the grinding, uh, at least uh, when I tried it last with the Lunt telescope. Looks like it looks like you have grit in your uh, screw. Thread. Well, this is some this is somebody else's. It looks pretty bad here. Yeah, yeah. pretty ugly oh. grease. The grease on my I find, Usually, I find about springs behind a set screw uh, when it's too late. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can. Imagine. You know, it, this. Yeah, this is looking pretty dirty. My, my telescope, the mount had kind of like white grease involved. Uh -huh. Didn't look this bad. And uh -huh. uh, although, although they say these these gear motors, the uh, shaft coming out, the the bearing is pretty bad. And it can wear out, and you get a lot of slop there. And then there's a plastic gear on the pinion gear inside of here, and the gear motor that can get loose and cause backlash. And your belt, if it's too tight, that can cause the, of course, the wear and tear more than it should. And the belt is not very retained very well on this gear. There's there's edges on on this belt drive, but there's no edges on this one. I guess the newer ones, they have edges on the of the on the belt drive gear. So. And then in my in my inside the mount, I noticed there was a piece of metal uh, laying in some grease, so a little shaving inside the mount. So I wasn't happy to see that going on. But some maybe someday I'll have to hyper tune it. People are rebuilding these motors and putting in better quality bearings and things. But it's not not a cheap mount, and but there's. Evidently, they're slopping these uh, celestrons together pretty bad, so Profit. might want to be cautious. Hmm. It'll be forewarned. Wait, do the, to do the math on that, would just be crazy. I mean, you have a belt being driven on a on a certain size uh, dri driver there, and then the motor's turning a certain RPM, and then you have a screw. To figure all those things in together, that just sounds nuts. I think mechanical engineers, they got a good handle on that stuff. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I wish I, I wish I could understand it better. But looking at that picture, I mean, there were four different rates going on at one time. And then the shaft coming out to that from the motor, that didn't look like stainless. It looked like aluminum. That's, that, okay. that's another huh. stop spot. It's probably just it's probably a steel shaft, but it's but there is plastic gears inside the gear motor, and so there's there's lots of room for little errors. Yeah. That build up. Well, in the vein of taking things apart, um, Gary and I took apart an old cave um, reflector that he had been uh, bequeathed a few years ago and restored it quite a bit. It's a nice looking scope although a little inconvenient to use. But we can we can take a few pictures of that, resurrect the pictures of the restoration. We can show a brief thing on that next week. Sounds great. Which size, which size cave mirror? 
It was an eight inch F8 Renewtonian. Oh, nice. Planet killer. Planet yeah. Killer. It had an excellent mirror in it. We, we brought the, the mount is really, uh, you know, it's cast iron. It's very big. It's very heavy. It's a real finger pincher to set it up. But we set it up on a mount in my backyard one night and uh, looked around at things. It's got an excellent mirror in it. And of course, there's a registry of cave mirrors. I was just so, going to mention that. Yeah, Gary's is now on that registry. So, and he's looking to sell it. Not that I'm trying to get you yeah. to buy it, but I got a new idea. Yeah, about so selling it. I, I'm going to let I'm going to let somebody give me an offer. Yeah. So we're gonna we'll we'll collect our pictures of that and have them ready for next week. Oh, there was yeah. a 12 and a half inch cave. Uh, that was something like F13. I mean, it was this gigantic wow. thing at Westmont in the smaller dome years ago. Yeah. And uh, one of our members, Tim Wittenberg, uh -huh. carried the mount down the stairs oh. by himself. <laughs> I don't know how much that weighed. It's very heavy. Was very that heavy. the one that was kind of conical shaped and about no. eight inches thick? No, that was the one in the observatory at the museum. Okay. Because that was a monster. I yeah. got that catalog. You know, so that one that, um, uh, who is the guy that had the, the, uh, the 12 and a half, the cave that I have, Chuck? It's, uh, it was. Uh, oh, the oil it, one. Marv, Marv Johnson? Marv Johnson. And that, I went to this guy. I sent him images of the of the uh, the cave that he scratched on the side of the mirror, and wanted to know if this was if it was an a, 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 after all a real cave mirror or not. And there were numbers that were scratched out. And if I could just find, you know, it'd be neat if I could go back and find the information that he sent me back. And of course, we registered it with this registry, and um, he he told me that they had made a mistake. Because it was kind of when he finished the mirror, it was kind of at the end of a year. So they they kind of scratched out one of the numbers, and he was able to determine which year it really was. And I'll I'll try to look up those. I have those pictures somewhere on on the other computer, uh -huh. and I'll try and find that in the letter that he sent me back. It was kind of interesting. Okay, yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah, it, it, I'll try and find that because I sent him a bunch of. of pictures uh, that that he that he wanted to register it and then i asked him about how the guy scratched out the number uh -huh. and actually he said that he had seen that before so that that was neat what's you this guys can, you, you can see the cave mirror registry there yeah oh yeah yeah that's the registry what, oh, what okay. was the name what was the name, um, Tim, that you said, the person who had the mirror? It oh. was Marv Johnson, but it might be under my name. Huh. Well, it's going pretty fast for me to read. I'm, I'm scanning quickly. I wanted to get to my box out with my mirror to see if okay. you can put it on your list. Yeah. There's probably a way of doing a search on here and see control F. Yeah, there you are, Tim. I see your name right here. Oh yeah, Tim Crawford. Can you can you guys see that? Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, oh yeah, right. yeah. There it is right there. Okay, F6. I was a little bit uh <laughs> it wasn't F13, obviously. Yeah. Uh uh uh, Cave's personal mirror was a 12 and a half inch F11. Can you get to me? It says picture. Can you can you actually click on that and get a picture? And no, it doesn't look like it. it's not a link. Oh, okay. Somewhere somebody has a picture, I guess. Or maybe I that's do. how they how they verified it. That's how he verified it. He had me send him several pictures. But yeah, that was that, the the story behind that that, that Marv told uh, Chuck, I think. I got, I got it wrong. I thought it was something that was, went to Jet Propulsion Laboratories. That's what and, Marv said. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and then Gail told me 
it wasn't because I, you know, it was supposed to be a, a, a reference mirror. And Gail was telling me, no, that can't be because a reference mirror is, it's either a flat or a, or a, a concave mirror. I can't remember. It's not a parabola. But I mean, it's supposed to be a really, really good mirror. Needs to be it needs to be re-illuminized, but that's it. Uh huh. And it had the original, it has the original cell that came with that. Has the original diagonal, and I think the diagonal size is wrong. I, I hate to say that, but I think it is wrong. I'll try, I'll go. The, I'll go over that. I hope to get back to the workshop yeah. sometime because yeah. I can bring that all with me and show you guys. Gary, yeah. is your is your mirror listed on this? What? Is your mirror listed in this list? Uh, I don't know. I've never looked at that list. Oh. It is 705-381. 705 Yeah. 705 No, there's no there's no 705-381. Take off the one. What about 705-38? 705-38, no. No, you might be go go down. What does the M mean? Is that the initial of the person who ground it? Um, probably, is, probably means mirror prefix. M. It just says a prefix. Do they have a list of who ground it at the top? In the beginning, they say cave refigured it and. Yeah. Just says cave optical most of the time. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh... Gary, what's your last name, Gary? Peterson. Peterson. Let's see. Can you? There, there were, there's a Peterson. It would owner. be. It would be Tim Myers. Tim. Uh, Tim Myers was the original owner. Myers. M e y e r s. I think. Hold on. Usually it's. Ah. It's M y e r s. No, no Myers that way. You said M E Y M E Y. I think that's uh, M -Y. No, not finding any Myers. Uh -huh. Lots of M's though, I see. <laughs> what chain? Must be a bell curve. Yeah. Well, you know, we we don't see the serial number for seven, whatever that number was, 1970. 705 381. Don't see anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Looks like so it's it's one of the missing mirrors. We'll have to get it on that cave site. This is this site. I mean where you are. I don't know what he's looking at. Uh the Tom Totten is, is the one with the website open on his machine. Yeah, yeah. I've I've typed in the, the website link in the chat box. Oh great. And when when I post this video on YouTube, I will I attach the information from the chat box in part of the comments to the video, so you might be able oh, to get there true. that way as well. Yeah, it's 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 F eight, it's sixty three and three sixteenths inch <laughs> focal length. Kind of find it kind of weird. So if, if the number is correct, it, was, it must have been made in 1970. Yeah, I, I think I was going 1971. Some, oh, you some, know what? The, here's, here's a Charles Peterson. Yeah, right next to that. Well, that's not him. <laughs> yeah, he scratched it on the side of the mirror. You mm -hmm. saw it, right, Gary? Way back when? What's that? You saw the inscription way back yeah, when? Yeah, uh, it uh, scratched into the mirror, yeah. He wrote uh, production dates and usually who made the mirror. Some of the best ones are from AK, which is, stands for Alica Herring. Oh. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Well, it looks like it's my time um, tonight. I'll... Uh, we can talk about my stuff next week along with Gary's stuff. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for that that picture right now, maybe on here, but oh. I'll, I'll 
I'll, what I'll do is I'll find all those things and try to try to bring it. Okay. But it's a, it's interesting because I got I got a pretty good picture of the edge of the mirror where he scratched it on, and uh, I just I just like I said I can't find it now, but I know I have it somewhere. Yeah, everything about that scope was cave, except the the mount has been modified, um, unbelievably heavy. And yeah, no, that's the way they were. Everything. Oh, has... Tim. Sorry. Go ahead. The the legs are like like a rocket coming out, kind of di you know sideways. Yeah. No, it can hardly well, stand to pick it up. Let let me show you a cave mirror that Tim had at the telescope workshop. If well, I that's can. it. That that'll be it. Yeah, that's. So this thing right here. So it. It's cave oh, seven five that. seven five yes. zero one four zero one four zero. I don't I don't see it on the cave registry. So nineteen seventy five. Seventy five. That's yeah. not the one I had. Because it's somebody else's. It's yeah, it's somebody else's. Because see how it's conical. Well, this looks a little well. Hmm. Yeah, they they were cast. That's the way the mirrors were cast back in that day. Okay. All the from Corning were conical. I'm gonna try and find that. I'm gonna find. I don't know where what I did with it. I I just ran into it the other day. I have a feeling it's on the other computer. Okay. And it's too bad because it, there was a real good close up picture of how they scratched out the number. And uh, it's too bad I don't have it right here in front of me. That'd be great. Did you ever bring it into the telescope workshop? I think I did because we had to take a look at it and see, uh, you know, we we had to take take a look at it. That's why I wish we still had it because I could bring it. It's I've got it in a it's stored away, and actually I'd like to bring it out. I hope I'm not going to get any kind of like uh, fungus growing on it or anything. It's in a fairly dry place. Okay, I'm going to sign off, folks. Nice okay. to see you again. All right. Thank you. See you next week. Okay. Ta ta. Bye. Good meeting. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Guess it's time right. time to leave. Okay. Bye. I'll try and find that. I could, you know, it'd be interesting to find that, and uh, I'll send it to myself so I could. And mm -hmm. I'll try to find that letter too. Here's here's another cave for you. Ah. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, All right, folks. I'm going to time out. So we'll see you later. Okay. Okay. Later. You guys. Okay. Bye. And ending. Bye. -bye.